Santos is here. Mr. Santos, you say hello. Also, is uh, Council Member Renee Spring here? Is he in the room? Okay, well, he may be here soon. And from the Office of Senator Kamala Harris, Nicole Kaneko Burak, Executive Assistant and Field Representative for Senator Harris. In the room? Not yet, okay. I have to allow for traffic coming from south from the north to the south. And from the Office of Supervisor Mike Wasserman, Kira Valenta, Policy Aid to Supervisor Wasserman. Are you here? Okay, well, we'll acknowledge you when you do arrive. And welcome everyone to join us for this. Uh, uh, also, by the way, this particular meeting is being uh, live streamed on Facebook, so wear your smiles tonight because you will be uh, very much uh, on camera, I'm sure. And we want to thank you for joining us. I encourage you to comment with any questions you may have, and we will address those during the question and answer period at the end of this particular meeting. So, um, I programmed it, I didn't memorize this. Uh, the last time we met was last September 17th, and at that time we gave you an update as to where we were on, we had good, good attendance at that time. Uh, and we were able to provide you updates on the information. We have more current information to share with you. The Santa Clara Valley Water District is dedicated to keeping your water safe and reliable and keeping the dam operating safely for the community as the community remains our top priority. Since 2009, Anderson Dam has been operating under a storage restriction for safety reasons. Currently, the reservoir evaluation restrict elevation restriction is equivalent to 58% of the reservoir's full capacity. Another top priority is seismically, seismically retrofitting several of our local dams as soon as possible, starting with Anderson Dam. Anderson is our largest reservoir and provides a reliable <coughs> supply of drinking water to Santa Clara County. The dam is 67 years old and needs to be retrofitted, which is why we initiated the project back in 2012. This evening, our staff will share with you an updated overview of the project, the anticipated construction staging areas and hall routes and next steps. This is part of our commitment to keeping you informed as the project progresses. With that, I'd like to turn it over again to our program coordinator, uh, Catherine Roman, who is the Deputy Operating Officer of Water Utility, and also Amon Desai, the Unit Manager for the District's Dam Safety Unit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, can you put up the next slide, please? 
So first of all, I want to welcome, as Director Varela said, we're live streaming this meeting on Facebook, so I want to welcome all the people that have joined us online. We hope this will be a productive and good use of your time, and we thank you for joining us. So a few housekeeping things before we get started. I'll go through the agenda first and then um, do the housekeeping. That's, that's the order I've been given. So here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to provide you a project status, tell you about some of the different components and how they have changed since the last time that we presented to you in September. We're going to review the project schedule, and then we'll allow ample time for a Q&A, question and answer session. So in the last time, since the last time that we presented our project to you in September of 2017, we have spent a lot of effort refining the design of the construction that we're going to be doing. You all remember that in February of 2017, there was a near disaster up in, at Oroville Lake with the uh, severe damage to the Oroville spillway. And because of that event, the Division of Safety of Dams mandated that a number of dams all around California, that staff take a special look at the conditions of the spillway at their existing dam. So we spent time last fall doing that condition assessment. We'll give you an update on that. And then we've also developed really more detailed plans as to how this multi-year construction is going to work. Where are we going to move all the dirt to? What kind of an impact will it have, especially to the neighborhoods that are very close to Anderson Dam? We are also in the process right now, and I'll mention that later, writing the environmental impact report. So we have to do the assessment of all of these construction impacts and include them in that environmental impact report document so that we have a strong and defensible document. So let's go over the housekeeping. I hope that you all picked up some of the information that was per provided at the tables. We have a shell, which is this outer folder about the project. Then there's also, I think, almost a 40 question and answer, frequently asked questions with nice colorful pictures, so we encourage you to read those. Those have been updated since last September. And then finally, we have, as we always do, a meeting survey. I think it's in the back, or maybe it's in the front. But again, we ask you to fill this out. We take these very seriously. We collect them, we go through them, and we figure out how can we improve our presentations. So this is important for us. We'd really appreciate if you could take a few minutes when we're done or even while we're speaking to provide that input to us um, at the end. So I'm going to now begin and just introduce the project. And I'm going to have to read sideways because I didn't memorize this long list. I think we're going to do this. Great. All right, so here are some of the items that we are working on and that we have completed over the last six or eight months. So back in September, we told you that we were at the first level of design. We usually call that 30%. So we've spent the last six to eight months refining that design. We just take a closer look at everything and modify things as we see fit. So we just recently completed the 60% design. We're now going to wait for all the necessary agencies to review those designs, provide us input, and then we're going to move forward to what the next step is, which is 90% design. 90%, then we take it to 100% design, and at that point, the plans and all the specifications we put together will be ready to go out for bid for construction. We have taken a close look at construction sequencing, for the 30%, but we're now going to do that again for the 60% design. As I mentioned earlier, we're underway with the preparation of the EIR. We're still out there, you might be aware, we're still out there drilling and poking holes everywhere. And again, we need to do some additional geotechnical investigations to inform our design and to put a better project together. We completed a test program. We'll show you a couple of pictures of that at the end. And then we're about to launch a cultural subsurface and 
investigation. We have to, uh, just by our process, look at and um, evaluate whether our work, our grading, our moving the dirt around, is going to unearth any Native American remains that have been buried there for many, many years. So we have to do an initial study, an initial investigation of that probability, and again, include that in our environmental impact report. Next slide. So I'm sure most of you, if you've, well, if you've come before, you're familiar with the dam. This is an aerial view of Anderson Dam and its embankments. The spillway up in the upper left, uh, we have an outlet, that's a big pipe about five feet in diameter, that runs along the bottom, that's why it's a dashed line, runs along the bottom of the reservoir and discharges out to Coyote Creek at the bottom of the dam embankment. So you see the embankment, that embankment exists on both sides, we'll show you some cross sections later. And then the dam crest, which is that road that you can drive on uh, when you access Anderson <coughs> Lake. All right, and so now I'm going to ask Mr. Hamam Desai, who is the unit manager for the Dam Safety Program Unit, to come and discuss with you some of the key project components we want to share with you tonight. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, uh, I'm Hamam Desai. I'm the engineering unit manager for the Dam Safety Group, and I'll be walking you through the project. Uh, what's not shown on this slide is what were the problems you were up to uh, 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 fix. So uh, in 2008, the district undertook some studies, and they found that the, dam, the existing dam, which was built in 1950s, had three major problems. One, the foundation was susceptible to liquefaction. That is, if there was a strong ground shaking, what will happen to the foundation will lose its strength and basically the dam will collapse, or at least uh, uh, <coughs> be subjected to uh, uh, settlement. Second problem was there are a number of faults which crisscross the dam, they are they are going to the dam, and that would have an impact if they were to move, they, it would impact both the embankment of the dam, that is the dam itself, and the outlet structure, which is located under the dam. The third thing we found out, which was very significant, was that um, the dam itself, the material of the dam itself was loosely compacted and is subjected to, the, again, losing its strength, that is liquefaction doing an earthquake. So what you see right now is the concept where we basically solve all these problems. So I'll show you the components of the latest concepts and design. So the first is, like I said, the dam itself and the foundation are liquefiable. So the project basically aims to uh, replace, uh, remove most of it and then rebuild the dam. Uh, the existing outlet, like I said, has a vulnerability, it can be offset uh, during fault movement which crosses the outlet. Also, its size was adequate uh, as per the current standards and therefore it will be replaced by a uh, new outlet which is shown in orange. And then we'll have another outlet which is a redundancy because of the number of faults. We don't want to lose an uh, outlet structure during an earthquake where the fault moves and then we, we don't have any uh, functional outlet. So we have two of them, one is a high level outlet and a low level. So both of them together basically meet the DSOTs, which is Division of Safety of Dams, Drawdown Criteria. Next. Uh, like Catherine mentioned, uh, because of the Orville event in 2017, uh, Division of Safety of Dams asked all the dam owners across uh, California to reevaluate the spillway. We performed a reevaluation this fall, and basically the findings were that the, even though the current configuration and the current design of the of the spillway was adequate, it, there were not enough defense mechanisms there which would prevent an audible type of failure in the future. Next. Also, um, this shows the Coyote Creek, Creek downstream of the dam along Cochrane, basically the outlet structure, which I was talking about, the new outlet basically discharges, discharges into the, uh, it's, the new outlet structure is shown in, in uh, violet, and it's, it basically discharges water into the Coyote Creek. Because of the velocity of the water that will be coming out of the outlet structure, the, the, the about 1,300 feet of Coyote Creek will have to be armored. Next. So this is what the concrete armoring will look like. It's basically concrete mats, and 
uh, it'll help with the erosion of the concrete itself. So um, again, uh, DSOD and Ford had asked us to uh, do a condition assessment of the of the Anderson Dam spillway right after the Almond Dam uh, Almond spillway failure. And uh, we completed that in uh, this fall of 2017. The results, like I said, indicated that even though, I mean, it doesn't, the spillway doesn't meet current design standards, so even though it's safe, it doesn't have enough mechanisms to prevent an order type of failure in the future. Next, please. So here is the, here is the existing outlet. So we're going to replace most of the, uh, uh, the, the shoot slab, which is the bottom of the spillway. Uh, we'll also replace the walls of the spillway. Uh, they'll be taller, about four to eight feet taller than what, what they are right now. Next piece. Uh, the transition walls which let the water into the spillway will be also modified and changed. And lastly, the only piece that will be kept, which is in fairly good condition, is the crest, the one shown in green. And uh, that would be the full modification of the, of the spillway. Next piece. Now, coming to the construction sequence, it's very important. Uh, the dam will be, the project will be constructed over five years. The first two years, so this is the existing dam, it is at elevation about 6.7 right now. So the first two years uh, of the construction, we will be building the divergent structure. The divergent structure is basically uh, the low level outlet that will be functioning as a divergent structure during construction. Why do we need it? We cannot do this construction over one construction season. When I say construction season, it's summer, basically. So we can't move all this dirt, about two, two and a half, three million uh, cubic yards of dirt in one construction season. And therefore, it has to be done over two construction seasons. What, what basically happens then is, therefore, that we cannot count water against the dam when it's lowered between the construction seasons. So there'll be a winter between the construction season. The dam will be at a lower level and we can't impound water because of safety. So the divergent structure helps us basically keep the reservoir empty during those two, those two years. So the first few years, we'll build the divergent structure. We won't touch the dam until the divergent structure is in place. Next, please. So the third year, that's your construction season from April to October, we'll basically bring down the uh, dam to elevation 570. You see that dotted line? That was the existing dam, so this will be the configuration October year 3, that is just before winter sets in. Over the winter, it will remain at the same height. Then, at, during that winter, the reservoir will be kept low or drained using the reversion structure. Next year, which is year 4, again during the construction season, April to June, the first First few months, the, the dam will be lowered to what you see here. What you see here is the remnant of the existing dam, which is fairly good and will be kept in place. And in the very same season, we have to bring it back to 570. Again, this is for safety reasons. And then, year four, from October year four, we have to stage this configuration. And in the, it's, during that winter, again, the reservoir will be. Kept drain. So in all, there will be two years, two winters in which the reservoir will be kept drained for safety reasons. The final year, year five, construction season, we basically bring it up to the existing level plus another eight feet for, for a free board between the spillway walls. So that's the construction sequence. So that's the final configuration. The reservoir will be allowed to basically fill. So now the staging areas, the stockpile areas, and the disposal areas, and the bar sites for constructing this. So first I'll start with the bar site. The dam will be constructed with, basically we'll try to, we are trying to use about 90% or most of the material which will come out of the existing dam. So we'll be reusing it. What you see in the white are the areas <coughs> where we'll borrow whatever material is needed in addition to what we can salvage from the existing dam. In addition to borrowed material, we'll have material which are which cannot be found in nature, have to be engineered in quarries and things like that. Those will be imported. Stockpile in the blue areas, which you see on the uh, upper left 
left-hand corner of those blue areas, and then eventually brought to the uh, dam and uh, used for construction. What you see in the blue are basically stockpile areas. So what the whole philosophy here was to keep the impacts in the neighborhood to a minimum. So if you see, most of the stockpile areas are within the reservoir. And of course, we have to make sure that they remain dry through winter because we'll be using them uh, on multiple construction seasons. So what you see in the reservoir are the stockpile areas. The other two are going to be used only for imported material. And <coughs> the way uh, right now it's envisioned how the material from those stockpile areas, which are located outside the reservoir, will be conveyed to the dam is through conveyor system. So, we didn't want to close Malaguera and Cochrane all at same at, at, during construction for two years. So uh, the conveyor, uh, we, are, we, are in, we are planning a conveyor system which would help us keep these roads open for most of the construction year, except for a few instances where we have to close it for, uh, for a limited amount of time. So next please. All the access material which will be generated, which we call waste, will be basically lost in the reservoir or in resting those borrow areas shown in white. Next please. Oh, uh, can you go back please? One more thing. So the yellow areas are the staging areas. That's where you'll see all the equipment park, the trailers, the equipment, uh, you know, uh, valves, you know, material which are basically uh, engineered material to be all all, all of that, uh, yellow, those yellow areas which we call the staging areas. Next please. So again, like I said, the material which is stored out of the reservoir will be conveyed to the dam using conveyor system. The conveyor system will be installed in Malaguara and Cochrane and will take the material back and forth from the stockpile areas up to the dam and where it will be used for construction. So that's what's shown here. Next please. So that's the conveyor system right there. Uh, we, are not, we are looking at different designs for the conveyor systems, closed systems so that uh, you know, nothing falls off. We are also looking at damp, damp, dampers on the, on the uh, conveyor system so that it reduces the noise when it's operated. So this is an example right here. So this is the limit of Cochrane Road which will be closed uh, for it for a, a, a substantial period of construction. Uh, we have a wall which will be constructed at the toe of the dam and, and uh, all the material will be conveyed to the toe using this area which will remain closed during construction. Next please. Uh, also, because of security reason, FERC, which is Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Agency has requested us to design the new dam not to allow any traffic over the dam. So the new, in the new configuration, uh, traffic won't be allowed to pass over the dam. However, pedestrians will be allowed to go back and forth. Next please. Uh, so right now, the traffic goes up the dam on the road which is in green and then comes back down <coughs> on Coyote Road and up to, up to Cochrane. So we'll, we won't be able to come down Coyote, so the, uh, uh, Coyote Road. So the new concept basically what you see in green there is a widened two-lane uh, access road which goes up to the dam and down. Next please. So that's the part of Kyrie Road which will be removed, closed, but it will be available to pedestrians and for hikers to basically uh, use it as a trail. Next please. The parking lot will be expanded, a few more parkings will be added. Uh, this is the area where the bar was. So instead of filling up the bar back to its original configuration, we'll expand uh, the parking area there. <coughs> Next, please. Oh, so with this, uh, I'll uh, hand it back to Catherine, who will go over the project schedule and the uh, uh, environment process. Thanks. Thank you, Hemant. So just a few more slides uh, to finish off where we are. That was a lot of information on details. So if there was something that you didn't understand, please don't hesitate to ask during the question and answer, and we can clarify things. So this is a schedule. We have shown this before. We are currently now in the year 2018. So we have been working on the design for many, many years, as you can see. 
And about a year ago, we started the CEQA and the NEPA. NEPA stands for National Environmental Protection Act. All right, so a document has to be written to satisfy federal requirements because, as Mom said, this dam is under the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So we will be working with FERC staff um, and others to prepare documents to meet both the state CEQA requirements as well as the federal NEPA requirements. And then permitting, which we have, we have already started holding uh, conversations and meetings with different regulatory agencies, and we see that going on for at least another year. So right now we're showing construction beginning in the year 2020, with the caveat on the bottom left that says construction start will be dependent on us successfully securing all the necessary permits for construction. So next slide. So just one more slide to walk you through because this is where we'll again be looking for public participation. This is our environmental impact report schedule. So the CEQA process on the left hand side, we put out a draft environmental impact report. We respond to comments that we receive on that. We prepare a final EIR. And that, and then the district board considers that and certifies that EIR. So where are we now? We're in the top dark blue uh, spot. We are planning to put out a draft EIR for the public to review this fall. So September 2018. Where's the public involvement? There's going to be a 45-day review period. And that's when we're also going to hold another public meeting during that time, talk about the environmental impacts and the ways that we're mitigating the impacts, but also hear directly from you if you have comments on that draft document, anything that's written in there. We'll also be taking written documents and all the regulatory agencies that we require permits from will also be reviewing and commenting on that document. So you see that we're going to have a public comment meeting probably sometime in October. So after that 45 day review period is done, we'll be getting close to the holidays. That's when we will then be taking all the comments and incorporating them, responding to them and preparing that final EIR. And we will probably be coming back to you in the spring around the time that the final environmental impact report is going to be ready. So next slide. So finally, these are just all the different ways that you can keep in touch with the project. Um, we, we can provide this, uh, the links to you in the back if you want them. Emily Gross is in our communications staff, and so she is the one who is spearheading all of the um, input and questions, and so you're welcome to give her a call or to send her an email. You can also in the back sign up so that you get project updates via email. Uh, and then again, the link at the very top, you can look at the most recent project updates that we put on our website. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Oh, actually, one more slide. So remember I mentioned the test fill that we did. So the test fill was really just an exercise. It wasn't just, it was pretty big. And I think if you go up to the dam now, you can see the layers of dirt that have been placed and compacted in a manner similar to what the new embankment is going to undergo. So what we're doing is testing the different borrow materials that we're gathering, that we're going to use, running the rollers and the, the, the drum rolls and the bulldozers to really compact it to the right amount so that it will adhere and, and, and become a sound embankment. So these are just some of the pictures of the process that we completed just a few weeks ago. And as I said, if you want to drive up to the dam, you'll see those layers. They're going to be on display. No, no admission charge for that, but they will be on display for um, several more months because our regulatory agencies have to come and make sure that they agree with the way that we compacted them and that we meet their standards. So that concludes the presentation. We're going to open it up now to questions from all of you. How many mics do we have? We have two mics. We have two mics. And so we would like to, and for everybody to be able to hear the questions. So please 
raise your hand, and one of our staff will come around hey, and Jose. give you the mic. There are probably going to be a lot of questions, so we'll take the time and take everybody's questions, and we'll get to you as soon as we can. All right. Thank you. I had asked a question back at the September meeting if you had any conversations with the high speed rail people at that particular time. Everybody said no, you hadn't had any conversations. Have you had conversations since then about the difference in, the, in coordinating what's going to be done as far as movement of stuff? We have not contacted them directly, but we know that the high speed rail is going to be much further to the west. So it's going to be running much closer to the... We haven't made a decision on yet. All right, but that's... So it could come down, still could come down 101. Right. Either on the western part or on the east part. Uh, a decision has been made. You know, but the issue is, if you're going to be moving with trucks in some of the same area that they're going to be moving, because even if they do come down on Monterey Highway, they've already said that they're going to take some of the current highway and have to move it over. So it's going to be an issue. So I, I would suggest, as I did back in September, that we should start having conversations with them to understand what the ramifications are, no matter which way they go. Thank you. Good point. And also just to see what the schedules, how the schedules align, uh, because we we don't know exactly when that high speed rail construction will be. So thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Uh, is the water that you're going to be releasing from uh, Anderson Lake be diverted to other reservoirs in the county, or do we lose that value? Good question. So when we drain Anderson Reservoir, we can send the water to our treatment plants for treatment. We can also release it along Coyote Creek, and by the time that the project begins, we'll be able to release it to the Madrone Channel, as well as the main avenue ponds. Those are key groundwater recharge areas for South County. So we will put as much of that Anderson water as we drain it to beneficial use. Now some will flow all the way down Coyote Creek to San Francisco Bay, but some people say that's not such a bad thing either because it's gonna wet and pulse through the entire uh, creek all the way down to San Francisco Bay. But yes, the intent is to use as much of it as we can for the public and the drinking water supply. Thank you. I believe we had a question from Facebook. The, uh, oh yes, all right, comment. I can read that. So the Facebook comment came that said, that's a lot of dirt trucks on the roads for a long time, long with many O's with rocks flying off into windshields. So I can, if you want to pull back to that slide, Megan, um, that talked about the staging areas and the stockpiling areas. So what I want to re-emphasize that may not have made it clear, and just by the, the size of the blue areas, I can see where people would be concerned. The, the blue areas on the left-hand side is open space that's owned by Santa Clara County. And we had originally, we had been talking to them about using those areas for stockpiling. But we're very, very cognizant that two to three million cubic yards of dirt coming down, whether it be by trucks or conveyors, is going to have a significant impact on that neighborhood. So as we have refined our design, we've really shifted more to the stockpile areas on the right. And as Simon said, those are within the reservoir. So when the reservoir is drained, obviously we're going to have a lot of dry area. And so the intent right now is to maximize, as we peel away the layers of dirt from that embankment, is to send it down into the reservoir and stockpile over there. That's going to really reduce the amount of truck traffic that will be in, in effect along the neighborhood roads. Okay. All right, another question? Hi, I have two questions, thank you. Will the excavation continue in the winter if into later months if it's a dry winter? Good question. That is going to be determined probably at the time at, in that particular season. Now, going back, Megan, can you show what we're going to when we deconstruct the reservoir in the first year or year three? So year one and two, we, we, do, water, we, we, we do the tunnel, 
for the diversion. Year three, as Hamal said, we're going to take it from the existing height of about 647 feet down to 570. Could we continue working during the winter if it's dry? And the answer really is no, because if we continue deconstructing the dam, that lowers our ability to hold back water during significant rainstorms. And so we have done a lot of modeling to figure out what is that sweet spot where we can, we can be assured we can bring down the reservoir to 570 in that six month period, then the best thing to do is hold it right there. All right, and wait for the winter to go by. Then, ne next slide, we take it down the following spring to near zero, and in the same year, we build it back up. Look, we're building it up to 570 again. Again, that will provide the maximum safety in terms of preventing flooding. However, in this fourth year, if it remains dry, then we would ask the reg agencies if we could continue building it up. Because the higher we can build this dam before the rains come, the better for everyone. So in this year, we would definitely see if we could continue building. And so even though you have temporary diversion uh, tunnel for the removal of the water, you're anticipating water accumulating during the rainy season. And that's what you're concerned with? We are concerned more about water um, getting contained there during periods of high flows. So that tunnel is going to be able to discharge up to 6,000 cubic feet per second. That's a lot of water. That will be in, and we don't want to discharge that much because it could likely cause flooding downstream along Coyote Creek. So we're going to have the controls to decide how much water to let out. And it's going to be a day by day, week by week, month by month, adaptive process. See how much it rains, try to empty that runoff from the watershed safely without running the creek too high, but drain it before the next storm begins. And for those of you who have lived here a long time, you know that there's no prediction as to how quickly rains will come, how much dry, how many dry days there will be in between the rainstorms. So it's really going to be something that we will be watching very, very carefully. Um, number one, to protect that interim dam. We don't want that spilling over. Number two, to try to minimize the flows that go down along Coyote Creek. Oh, thank you. And I have one more question that was my original question. The conveyor belt and also actually all of the construction, will the conveyor belts primarily be run during the daytime hours, Monday through Friday, not 24-7? Not so uh, right now, like uh, Catherine mentioned, uh, most of the stockpile which are off the reservoir will basically only have the imported material, which is engineered material from pouring. And given the amount of, of that material, we do not expect that the conveyor belt will be run 24 hours a day. It will be at, um, most likely on an as needed basis, but that analysis will still have to be refined. Question over here from this gentleman. I understand that uh, you're going to start dewatering in 2020, but what can be done to uh, let us have recreational boating between now and then? And why don't we have any water this year? All right, so I just got a similar request or, or a question from um, Andrew Jones on Facebook asking, any chance Anderson will be open to boats next year? So I'm presuming he means summer of 2019. It seems it is closed to boats this year and the dam work hasn't even started yet. So I'll also ask if Director Varela wants to say a few words about that because our board of directors last fall made a conscious decision to lower the reservoir at the beginning of the winter so as to prevent another spillover that we experienced in 2017. That's a very important area. That to, and thank you for that question. <coughs> Excuse me. So your board of directors are very concerned about any incidents, incidents that could occur by having the dam allow itself to fill. If you recall last year during the, the, um, the uh, event that we experienced, the first part of January, 
the dam was about 58 or 60 percent. Yeah. When did that storm hit? We remember the date? Nineteenth. So the first day. I was at Target. I looked up. Anderson was spilling. It was a Saturday afternoon. The, the warnings went out on Monday that the dam was going to top, which it never did. So be aware that under these extreme weather circumstances, we could have an empty dam that will fill up in a little less than a month. And that is the reason why your board is doing everything we possibly can to prevent these type of occurrences. But if Mother Nature decides to give us another experience that we did last year, we have to be prepared for it. We all have to be prepared for it. So in reference to recreation, from what I understand, there may be some recreation allowed on that, and we're still trying to determine that with the county as to what the extent will be and when will that be allowed, and the amount of boating that will actually be allowed on the reservoir, of, if any at all. So. Is there any chance of boating less enough to boating? That's, um, that's a question I'm not sure. I mean, if you're gonna close this one, yeah, I, you know, I don't have an answer for you, but give me your name and I'll make sure I get back to you with that. Yes? I have a follow-up then. Uh, you okay. do have the ability to import water into Anderson because it was green very low during the winter time. Okay, we didn't get the rain. It was held at a low level. And then all of a sudden, you guys put a bunch of water in there, whether you bring it from the Delta to San Luis, through Coyote and into Anderson. And you have the capability to bring it back up to that 58% level so that we could enjoy recreational boating until you actually drain the entire lake. So what can be done to accommodate uh, those activities? So you're absolutely correct. So again, um, as Director Varela said, the board took the action to lower the reservoir even further, further down than the restricted level that we're allowed to operate it at. It was, I think, by December 1st of last year. And a gamble was taken. Was it going to rain hard or was it not? And here we are in June. It didn't rain that much, right? And so the reservoir never really filled up. Yes, in the spring, we began filling the reservoir with water from the San Luis Reservoir down on Pacheco Pass. Enough so that we've got enough flows during the summer to release for what we call environmental reasons, all right? So there is a part of our operation is that we are compelled to release a certain amount of water on a daily basis, especially in the dry months, to sustain the ecosystem of Coyote Creek. And I believe that staff did the, the operations staff did the calculations to figure out how much do we have to put into Anderson so that we will have those environmental flows available for discharge all summer long. I don't have an answer for you, sir, as to why we didn't continue to fill it up. Um, again, if you um, provide us with your email address or a, a name and telephone number, I can look that up and talk to our operations people and get back to you. I'm really not concerned with why things happened that have already happened, but what can be done going forward to maybe help us out, you know what I'm saying? I understand that it needed to be drained or lowered for safety. I understand the ecological flow, but recreational boating, especially since we're going to be without the lake for five years between now and that time would be a good thing. That's all. Thank you. And just to, just to clarify, you won't be without boating for five years because the first two years when that tunnel is being built, we're still going to hold water in the reservoir as usual. Now, it'll still be at the restricted level. And depending on our winters and our board decision to allow for more storage at the beginning of a winter, if we have a drier winter, we may come up short again. But it's going to be a year-to-year -year discussion, debate, and decision by our board as to how, where to set that level at the beginning of the wet season. Speaking about the decision, so your board of directors also decided to continue a 20% level of conservation through the uh, through forever, essentially, until the existing board decides and the future boards decide to either increase or decrease that. But here's some really interesting and very good news for you to hear. Our aquifers, our watersheds are full. They're at capacity. 
in some cases, cases we've seen artesian wells popping up. So our groundwater is in good supply. For how long? Don't know. Hopefully we will not be experiencing a drought in the next four or five years. But we do know at some point we will again experience a drought. That's the way it is in the state of California. For the last hundred years, this, we have dry years and we have wet years. So with the amount of water that we received last year, our groundwater is at capacity. Our storage facilities, which is, as we are hearing today, have to be retrofitted. And we have four dams that are being retrofitted this year. So that is what you can see. What you cannot see is what we're standing on right now. So that's good news. We do have water for our future. And so we're thankful for that. A question over here. Uh, given what happened in 2016, I'm personally very grateful for the decision that the board made to limit the water in, in the dam during the, in the reservoir during the recent season. I think it was very wise because not only did we experience enormous damage downstream with some 16,000 people being forced out of their homes. We also ran the extreme danger of a total annihilation of this entire valley should we have had an earthquake large enough to cause that dam to fail when it was full and over time. I'm very grateful to the board and I hope that they will continue, as you just indicated, Catherine, to study the matter each year and make sure that the dam is controllable. What happened in 2016 is that the weather simply overcame all of the, the, the system's capabilities to keep the dam at the appropriate uh, mandated level. And I hope that never happens again. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the closure of Cochrane. I couldn't tell from the slide exactly what section of Cochrane will be closed. Be closed? Is it is it going to be the full five years? Uh, it may be uh, it may be around that uh, period. I think it will be about four to five years because there's some construction at the toe of the dam, which requires that to be closed. Plus, all the equipment will be uh, using that road to go up to the dam for construction. Okay. And, and you made a comment about hiking that you you know, the dam would be, or the surface would be closed to vehicles, and the road would be closed to vehicles, but, so is there still, people are going to still be able to get up the, the serpentine trail, or up the road, or what, what's going to happen with hiking? Yes, so the hiking part doesn't change. Uh, you know, the yellow line, what you see, that will be accessible to hiking. So you can go on the other side of the dam using that. Right. Also, that red line you see, which is the road which goes, comes down from the dam right now, that will be open to it's just that it won't be big. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I do want to clarify, that's this post-construction. So during construction, there will be no access for pedestrians 
in that whole area. And I also wanted, can we go back to, oh, this is the slide to the closure. Uh, you're right, and we'll try to bring a, a, a new Google view of, um, of this area, because I know that all of the, the Borello property is getting, um, is getting developed. But if you look on the left-hand side, you see that lone oak tree? That's near the entrance to that area where all the new estates are going. So that area will continue to be open for the local traffic. Question over here. Hi, what, if anything, are you doing to mitigate for impacts to wildlife movement with this conveyor system? I'm trying to understand how this system will work. Is it a pretty solid barrier? Is it porous? Uh, we know wildlife move along creeks, so I just want to make sure that there's some mitigation for any impacts there. Okay, great question. I'm going to introduce another member of our project team. Mr. Rick Hopkins works for Live Oak Associates and he is our environmental lead. So he is in charge of leading the effort to prepare the draft environmental impact report. So I'll ask him to provide a response. Yeah, the design has not been completed yet in terms of how that uh, conveyor system will, will be laid out, but it will not be a complete barrier. It will be actually elevated in places that uh, vehicles can go underneath and at least in one location, the second one. And so it's not in the creek, it's, it's basically along the Malagara Road. It's closing half the Malagara Road. So animals can still, not everywhere along there, but much of the ways along there, they'll still be able to move back and forth in the creek. Question, you have a question? I have a couple of questions. Uh, last year you talked about uh, working on the EIR report, and what I'm looking at now is it looks like you're about a year and a half behind schedule. And it's ironic because you mentioned the Oroville. The Oroville Dam failed in the winter of 2016, 2017. They began work on it immediately. Okay? Why aren't we doing the same thing here? We have, we're, we're, we're faced with a potential dam failure here. So what's taken so long? Well, a couple things. Orville was an emergency situation so that they fell under the emergency rules because it was an actual failure where they moved, I don't know, 40,000 or so folks out of that area over the concern of it uh, actually collapsing. This is predicted that, you know, if a certain size earthquake hits, there could be some aspects to that. And that's one of the reasons why the reservoir at the moment can only be uh, at 58 percent because the is very concerned about the amount of water. So we don't have the full amount of water in to start with. Uh, secondly, the actual EIR is actually moving along very quickly. There were many design aspects that sort of delayed things when we went from 30 to 60 percent because they, dis they discovered many things along the way which caused them to sort of rethink about how to best do this work. And so that's where the delay really kind of came about. And the EIR is actually moving along this summer and we're uh, uh, targeting to release it in September of this year. So that's actually a fairly uh, quick process. Just another question regarding the diversion tunnel. Is that going to be done by a TM? <clears throat> uh, uh, TBM tunnel boring machine. Yeah, uh, uh, we haven't worked on those issues yet. But normally what we do is we, we let the contractor decide on the tunneling method, except if we have, that means the, as an owner, if, if it has permanent impact or permanent design. So right now what it looks like is we would most likely go for a drill and blast with the road owner. So that's another one possibility because of the length of the, of the tunnel. What was it again? I uh, Road header and drill and blast. So the cut and cover? No, no, no. So it's a road header machine, basically it's oh, called okay. an EBM. Okay. And wherever, wherever we'll hit very okay. hard rock, it'll be you know, blasting and uh, okay. mixing. Yeah. A follow on to that uh, gentleman's comment. Uh, Anderson Dam was built just after World War II <clears throat> um, with equipment that a civil engineer today would laugh at. That took one summer. Right now you're projecting maybe, maybe in 15 years, you'll take care of that. Uh, it seems like, and uh, you made a comment about a very quick uh, EIR. Uh, the EIR is taking longer than it took to build a dam. It took one year, or one summer. 
it, it seems like things are out of control here as far as time. Uh, could you address that a little bit? So you're absolutely right that dam was constructed, I believe in 1950, in a very short period of time. That's one reason why we have to fix it, because they kind of threw it together quickly. Uh, they did it to the codes and the understanding of dam safety back in the day. But the world has changed. The codes have changed. Our knowledge of seismic effects have changed. And the world of regulation is probably changed more than anything else. So there was no secret document that had to be prepared in 1950. There was no state law that said any project had to review in document form the impacts of the project, both uh, temporary as well as permanent. So we live in a world that has become, whether we like it or not, highly regulated. And I'm sure that you're aware in so many different aspects of life, we are under regulations that did not exist 70, 80 years ago. There are reasons for that. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but we have to live and operate in a world that has become very constrained as to what public agencies can do in terms of speedy and quick projects. That it really, you know, we believe we're working fast, and to you it probably seems like snail's pace, um, understandably, because why would it take so long to put these documents together? We are trying to write a document that won't be subject to lawsuits. There are people who don't want to see this project go forward, and unless we do a very careful and diligent documentation, we could get mired in lawsuits that would then go to court and everything stops until those lawsuits are resolved. So there are reasons for our caution, there are reasons for the time that it takes to get to these milestones. And it's a myriad of reasons, as I just said. Um, do we, we wish we could do it faster. That is certainly not something that we're choosing to do, but we have to live within the laws of the land. Question back here. What do you anticipate the uh, effect of the construction to be on the access to Coyote Creek Trail? I haven't heard anything. Coyote um, Creek Trail will be kept open. There may be some diversions here and there as to how you want people to access it, but uh, the goal is to keep that open. No question back here. I uh, guess, Catherine. I, I just want to drop back to the uh, previous question or questions regarding the boating activity on uh, the lake. There, are you uh, in talks with you know the uh, the ranger department or somebody? You, you, you said you were talking to somebody, and you, you didn't mention who it was regarding the, the lake level. Why boats aren't out there this year? What's going to happen? I mean, it's just it seems it's hard to get a definitive answer on that activity. You know, I noticed the lake's been coming up in the last month. Do you have an answer why that is? I can answer that. So I, I think it, it's this. It's similar to what I um, responded to another gentleman earlier that we are putting enough water into the reservoir so we can do what we call the environmental releases during the next four or five months of the dry season. So we are not regulated, but there's an understanding with the, the, the fish agencies and other agencies that we will release water to keep the creek wet to sustain the ecosystem that's there, downstream all the way to San Francisco Bay. So enough water has been put in, and it's really not the rangers from Santa Clara County, it's our own operation staff. So that's what I offered to the gentleman who had asked earlier. If you leave your name and phone number, I'll get back. We don't have an operation staff, and that's a note to self to bring them along next time so that they can answer these questions directly. But I can find out what the plan is for additional water being put in from San Luis Reservoir, when that might happen. If it won't happen, why not, so that we can provide you a complete answer. Well, a month ago, just like to add to that, if I may. So, 
The county operates recreation and all the reservoirs, not the water district. So you might want to contact the county, because I do believe they've already established an issue their operating uh, uh, curriculum through this summer. And they have posted publicly what the operating times and which reservoirs will be used for recreation purposes. Uh, so I would, uh, the, ask, the question that you're asking us tonight, you might want to also uh, contact your representative from the county uh, locally here. That would be Representative Mike Wasserman, who's your county representative, or directly to their website to look for their operation schedule for recreation on all their county uh, recreational facilities. And that should answer your questions. Who gives permission for public well, going on the reservoirs? The public. issue I had was, is that months ago, the county. The county. a month ago, I went to the parks department off of Malagero at the ranger station tracked down one of the rangers over there and asked him about the lake since I saw the water coming up. And he said, uh, you know, that lake's closed indefinitely, or at least till probably 2026 when they're done with the you know, work there. So the, the idea that, you know, the residents, the community is deprived of using that lake, whether it's motorized or otherwise, uh, doesn't seem right. We heard that same thing. I mean, it doesn't seem right, and nobody has an answer. Well, I, can tell you the I think we are answering your questions to the best of our ability with the information that we have. Again, I'm going to repeat. Contact the county. The county should be able to answer those questions that you're asking us tonight. We don't recreate. We do not offer recreation. We don't manage the recreation of the, of the lakes. We don't. That's the county. And the gentleman you referred to is the county. what department? I beg your pardon? The de what department is the gentleman you referred to? Department of Recreation, I would imagine. Does the Water District give permission for boating on their reservoirs? We have agreements with the county. So, so if we go to the county, the county is not going to point the finger back to you guys. So, what so, is, so who has the ultimate authority to whether you put a boat on a lake in this county? Is it the water district? That's a different question. I think I'll need, I need to really find out what that answer that question will. I don't have the answer for that. I don't. But I can certainly find out. Yeah, can you contact them? Is office here? You said you didn't introduce them. What they came office? Uh, uh, I don't know. He's the supervisor. You can look it up in the government pages of the telephone book under the County of Santa Clara Supervisor's Office. I understand that. Okay. You've a question back here for the representative from my Washington's office. Was supposed to be here tonight, but don't go to uh, So, can you ask them if they arrived? Did you arrive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question back here. Wait, one more. Mike Wasserman is a very reachable individual. Okay? If you haven't contacted him, then, you know, you, you can call him, you can email him. He will be more than happy to sit down with you over a cup of coffee. And, well, okay. <laughs> I, I just have a, a comment about the gentleman's question over here about why it's taking so long to rebuild this dam. Not only should it take a long amount of time to do the research, the study, the engineering, the permits, and the environmental impact, if it didn't, and we slapped it together in a year or less, like we did in 1950, and we had a flood and rain event that we did in 2016, he be possibly the first guy to call a lawyer. And, and I, I, I really appreciate that it's taking a long time. The study and research is being done, especially the environmental impact. So thank you for that. Good. I had a question about the construction itself. You're going to be excavating it down, and you had a cut slide that showed the red section and the blue section. And is that the original foundation? Yeah, that's. Yeah, so what you see in the red, that small you know, uh, triangular uh, bar, that's the, uh, the, the, that's the portion of the dam, the original dam that we kept. Right. Is that concrete or is that rock? No, no, no. That's clay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Question over here. No, oh, I'm just curious. Who's going to get all the fish that are in there? <laughs> <laughs> um, this 
good question. We don't really have an answer to that uh, at this stage. I know in the mid 80s when they do water the reservoir, there was uh, this sort of conga line, as I understand, going to the reservoir, people trying to get the fish and they were handing them out. Uh, I, I don't think that's what's going to be happening this time, but that, that has not been resolved or designed at this point. The construction of the dam will obviously have a significant impact on the beautiful parks right below the dam. And I noticed that that wasn't even mentioned or addressed. Uh, could you say some words of what's during the construction, what will be uh, happen to these parks? Right, so during construction, yes, you're right, uh, impacted. However, we have a restoration plan which we are working with a uh, company box with. Once that is done, we have a pure in our 90% design. So all the all the stuff will be restored just the way it is after the construction. The project, as I see it, is going to have an effect on a great many things: recreation, parks, trails, flora, fauna. What we're missing the picture. The biggest effect is what it's going to have on us humans. I serve, my house is served by a well. Anderson serves as the major source for the refreshing of the aquifer. Now, you said our aquifers are at 100%. I don't know that, okay? And that concerns me. Now, I understand, too, that you're doing some work to mitigate that, and I applaud you for doing that. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that you've got this under control, but just Give me some reassurance that we're in good hands. Rest assured, you're in good hands. <laughs> Show me. And, and I will okay. add. I, I know you're constructing those pipelines, and you mentioned it just briefly that that part of the process is these two pipelines that you're building to divert some water to uh, the main uh, storage facility and the Madrone are, that's part of the plan, isn't it? That's part of the plan. So we are right now installing a new pipeline right. that connects to Anderson Dam <coughs> and will take water both to the Madrone Channel and to the Main Avenue Ponds. However, and that pipe was put in place, I believe, back in the 1950s, 1960s. Yeah. Very old probably didn't get the right cathodic protection. Um, tree roots got into it and started chewing it apart. So for many years now, the water that you see flowing into Madrone Channel, right there along 101, has come from San Luis Reservoir. And so our reconnection to Anderson Dam will actually provide you two ways of, re will provide us two ways of recharging the groundwater. So until the Anderson project gets, starts under construction, we drain the reservoir. We will now have, once this project is done, I think early in 2019, we will have the capability of using Anderson water to recharge along the drone channel and at the main avenue ponds or the San Luis Reservoir water. When Anderson is dry, God provide plenty of water to fill San Luis Reservoir, that will become the source of your groundwater recharge. So we have different ways, fortunately, a portfolio of different water sources that we will be using to cover to cover the residents during so that time. You see that is the San Luis Dam, which is now filling that, the drone, which is great. That's good to hear. Right now, I didn't know that. for many years, it has been um, San Luis Reservoir, correct? Yeah. Hi, I was um, concerned about the rate uh, that it, of the water that is available to draw down. At what rate is safe for the um, so we don't have any um, landslides like we did over on Dunn Avenue? So uh, we have studied that extensively. The rim of the reservoir for a drawdown. Right now, the rate we are using to draw it down. It doesn't seem to impact the landslides or aggravate them, basically. However, you know, once you remove the water off the landslide and they're already there, you know, they could, they could uh, move. However, uh, we are developing plans right now 
to survey them and make sure we buttress them in case that happens during construction. One thing I want to bring to your attention. So during the event that we experienced last year in the height of the of the uh, atmospheric storm, as he called it, um, you recall that Highway 101 had flooding. Do you remember that? Yes. And so what that was, that was an old, uh, I guess, channel from the Coyote uh, that actually water was being diverted on that because there was so much water flow. And it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it broke, a cavity, and water was streaming onto Highway 101. Yeah. So that whole portion was closed off. And that was repaired by the water district within 12 hours. And Highway 101 was open again within that timeline. So well, that was an emergency situation that none of us could do or saw it coming. So these things happen under these high intense water events. Oroville, with all the com you know, comments that are coming, the critics are out saying, you should have done this, why didn't you do that? Well, it was planned, it was built, and what happened, happened. And now that what we're doing is using that as an example so that we don't have those same occurrences here. With all the things that we're doing, with all the work that we're doing for protection, is it reassurance? Absolutely, 100% reassurance that nothing could ever happen that could cause the damn failure? Answer that question. So we're doing the best we can for you, for us. Hey, I live here too. I've been here 41 years. And I tell you, this is a wonderful place to be. And we have a dam. And we're doing everything in reasonably possible with all that you've heard tonight about regulations and believe me, folks, yeah. the people that we speak to that you don't uh, are amazing. And they're there also for your protection and your safety as well. So there's an entire army of people that are involved in this process that you'll never see. Chances are you'll never meet. We are the face and we are the voice for you to reach and talk and we will give you the information and hopefully you're comfortable with that information. And even if you're not, reach out to us. We want to respond in the best way we can. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question here. What do we see the relationship between a proposed twin tunnel project and the relationship between San Luis and Anderson? Yeah, with shotgun in your, in your head. Um, that's a very interesting question that we have to be determined. Um, so the Twin Tunnel projects, that, just by raise of hands, you know, I'll just tell me those in the room are familiar with the Twin Tunnels, Cal Water Fix. Okay, about, just about half. So what that is, that's a project uh, upstream from the Delta on the Sacramento River where there will be two tunnels, approximately 40 feet diameter, about 150 feet down, that will capture water uh, the, the spring flows from the Sierras and will bring water further south into the central part of California, southern part of California, and also here, where we will continue to import approximately 55% of our water from the Delta here, as you heard us say earlier, through San Luis. So the amount of water that will be coming down, we don't know exactly. Uh, we're talking about 9,000 CSF that is, project, uh, is uh, projected with a 10 tunnel, with a twin tunnel project. Much of that water will be going into the Central Valley, will be going towards Southern California, and will capture our percentage of water that we'll be getting here as well. So that is another source of water that we're looking at for the future, and that project is about a 10, 20, 15 year, 15 to 20 year project out. So hopefully, you know, it's all hypothetics at this point. All the experts are giving us the best information they can, and today's cost of that project is at $17 billion. Will that number hold? Don't know. So thank you for that question. That was a real good question. <coughs> Have a question taken over here. Hi everyone. My name is Kara Valenta. I work with Supervisor Wasserman. There you are. Hi. I, I heard I left like five minutes too early, so my apologies. I was popping into another meeting across the hall. I uh, just wanted, I'm not prepared to respond tonight, but I just did want to let you know. You are more than welcome to contact the office, and I will be the point of contact on this project for his office, and I will absolutely make myself available um, to get you guys more information as we move forward with it. <coughs> Thank you. 
Any more questions? All right, and that doesn't have to be the end because we'll stick around after the meeting. We've got some phone boards in the back there if you have any questions about those. Some of our consultants are lying low, but they are in the audience, so um, we can point them out to you. You can ask them the harder questions. Um, but I would like to thank everybody, those of you online who uh, stayed with us during this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, I want to just make sure that you're aware of our project webpage. Uh, you can sign up to receive project updates. We've got a table in the back. People will be there. Um, there are ways to submit additional questions through cards, and we'll put them into our FAQs. And if you can take a few minutes to fill out the survey, we'd really appreciate your input so that we can continue working on improving these presentations. And with that, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night.